first of all, thank you to the organization for having me this year again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, thank you all for being here. So let's get to it. So actually, I'm not a lead DevOps engineer at Uphold anymore. I'm a senior cloud engineer at Vanium. Uh, probably you guys already know what Vanium is. Uh, I'm one of the co-organizers co of DevOps Porto and the DevOps Days Portugal, uh, which was actually last week. So be, the next edition will be in Porto next year, so be attentive. Uh, I used to work only as a developer. I'm transitioning a little bit more into the infrastructure side. I'm an open source passionate. I used to contribute to Mozilla. I'm a Taekwondo amateur. I won't hurt anyone, I promise. Probably you guys will hurt me. I love metal, and you can find me at these, uh, at these addresses. So what are we going to talk to, about today? So a little bit about service mesh. Uh, what is a service mesh? What problems or challenges microservices, microservices uh, bring us? And, and we will actually talk a little bit about Issue, which is a, an implementation of a service mesh, and what it can actually do to make our lives easier. So here I have two quotes. Probably most of you guys already know them. So the Conway's Law, which states that the organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Basically, what this, what this is means is that the way that your organization is organized, so to speak, uh, will actually constrain the way that you design your systems. And Fred Brooks has an interesting observation which says that nine women, nine women can't make a baby in, in, a, in one month. So the analogy here is basically if you put more people into a project, it doesn't necessarily mean that the project will go faster. It will probably won't because of communication. So these are just a little bit of introduction so why microservices came to be. So nowadays what we want is actually to serve our customers better. And by better we mean faster and more reliable. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't, we don't have that much interest in actually delivering code faster if it or constantly breaking, and we don't want to like deliver a software like three, every three years and it actually doesn't bring any value to the, to the customer. So the industry started to evolve uh, using agile methodologies and started to think, okay, so we have like big code bases, it takes a lot of time to actually deploy this, to actually write the code on and all that kind of stuff. So what if we start to split this into small, smaller pieces? And that's what usually is defined as a microservices architecture. What microservices means in each organization might be a little bit different, but it, that this is basically the concept. So you're probably familiar with something like this. So you usually have a monolithic architecture where you have all your code going together, your libraries, everything works together as a big bloated thing, and you start splitting the, your, um, your, uh, your code into microservices. So the idea is that each microservice only focuses on one specific thing, thing and does it well. That, of course, has challenges and, and benefits. So the benefits, we can see that we, can f we have faster uh, delivery. So it's easier to write code. It's, uh, it's faster to deploy. It makes a lot easier for actually heading code in, into production. You can isolate it. So basically, if one service, is, service only does one thing, it needs to do it well but we have to be careful with this isolation. Scaling also comes as a benefit. So if you have like an authentication system, you have a lot of people authenticated to, to, to your system, you only need to scale that part of your system. Culture, you can basically start to uh, building teams around those services. Instead of having a, a one huge team doing everything, you can basically start building your own culture behind those. And it gives you a lot of flexibility. So each microservice can be run, can be using a different programming language. It can be using a different database, and, and so to speak. But this brings, uh, brings challenges. So one of the most common fallacies is that the network is reliable. We all know that it isn't. Uh, so as soon as you start splitting your big application to more applications, they actually need to start talking to each other, whatever protocol um, you desire. So one of, the, uh, one of the, 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 the first problems that you have is service discovery. So now your big application is divi divided into appli in app A and app B, so they need to find each other. How do, how do they find each other? You actually need some load balancing. So if you split and you actually scale certain parts of the application, it doesn't come it, it's, you have to load balance or else you don't get the benefit of that. You need to be fault tolerant. What this means is actually if one piece of your system goes down, you don't want all your system to go down. 
one interesting, very interesting aspect of Microsoft is distributed tree tracing. So if you only have one application, you have a big monolith, so it's easier to actually reason about what is happening in the system. As soon as you start having like two, three, four, dozens, hundreds of services, you actually need a way to, okay, so I received the request, what, what services were affected by this? I have a bug, where, where it was, where, where is it going uh, slower? It's on this, in this query on the database, is this processing this JSON file, what is it? Metrics, we already collect them, of course, in monolithic applications, but it becomes a, a bigger challenge since we now have to collect metrics from several services and in some way we have to aggregate them and make them have sense to us. And security, of course. You now have a bunch of applications just talking to each other. One application can have a bug, can expose your whole infrastructure um, to, the, to the world. So how can a service mesh actually help us uh, tackle some of these challenges? So very simply, what is a mesh network? So a mesh network is a, to a network topology where um, you don't have special nodes actually being responsible for certain tasks. So the nodes connect to each other directly and can reorganize. Of course, they have to have some way of actually getting information. We'll see how an implementation of that can be done. But that's the basic idea. So you don't have special nodes in charge of special things. That's basically what a mesh network is. So, what the service mesh aims to be is like the connective tissue between your, uh, between your services. So the basic idea is that you will have something in, alongside your applications that will, where you can actually offload some of your capabilities that you usually put uh, in, your, in, your, um, in your app. And your apps only need to f actually focus on business logic. Two important concepts on a service mesh, it's mostly uh, used in, on all implementations. So a service proxy, I think you are all familiar, you all, all of you have probably used or heard about service, things like service, uh, Nginx, HA proxy, traffic, and voice. So it's basically something that you put your, on your infrastructure where your traffic routes to and you add capabilities there, like retries, timeout, service discovery, whatever it is. And the concept of a sidecar, which is known as a decomposition pattern, where you actually, instead of having your app and everything is in there, you basically split your app into two, three, or four, or whatever it is, and you actually offload capabilities between those two. So th these concepts are important since Service Mesh will make use of them to actually be implemented. So this is a, a generic um, idea of a, what a Service Mesh looks like. We'll see that in a bit that Istio has a very, uh, uh, similar concept to this. So usually a service mesh is divided into two uh, pieces, the data plane and a control plane. So the data plane is where our apps will actually be run. So here are we have assets A, B, C of our apps. And as a sidecar, we'll have a proxy. So what this means is that any, any request that uh, your, our apps go, uh, do will actually be proxied to, through the, the, to the sidecar. So they will actually come here to, and will have a way to actually find other instances and communicate with them. Alongside this, we have the control plane, and the control plane will actually will be like management service for the uh, for a service mesh. There, you can where you will write your policies. We'll have some kind of an API server to actually um, do some interactions. Will be where metrics will be collected to to be sent to some some way to ob observe them to tracing. This is basically the gist of what it what this is. So. This is very pretty, but we actually need to make this more concrete. So there are several implementations of uh, Service Mesh. Issue is one of them, Linkerd is another one, Kong also has a Service Mesh and there are others. Issue is interesting because it's now being developed by Google, IBM, Red Hat, and a bunch of other interesting companies. And, and it's basically aims at giving everything that we uh, spoken before. So it's open source, it's actually being developed by a big community, it's one of the most active projects uh, out there and it's being designed with extensibility in, um, in mind. So the examples that we are going to see here in code will be mostly focused on Kubernetes, but the idea and the way that the code is written is actually to actually be, allow it to be deployed on any other platform, Nomad or even uh, servers, physical servers. So as you can see, this is very similar to what we've seen before. So here we have uh, our apps and we have the proxy. This one is called Envoy. It's what um, uh, Istio is using to make the proxy, and it has several components. The Mixer, Pilot, Galley, and Citadel. We'll touch briefly on each of them to actually understand what they're doing. So Envoy is actually the, 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 the proxy that, that's being used. Envoy 
is being used now, several companies handling millions of requests per second. So it's, very, it's battle tested, so it really works well. And we will see that most of the capabilities that Istio provides are based actually something that uh, Envoy already offers. It just needs a way to actually uh, interact with a, pla with a platform. The fact that it's deployed as, as, a, as a sidecar makes it really easy to get into your infrastructure so you don't really have to change any code since it will be agnostic to, um, to, to, your, to everything. Pilot is where the traffic management capabilities come from. So the idea of, of, of Pilot is that it will receive some kind of format of a file and it will, be, and it will convert to something that Envoy actually understands. So you don't have to actually know what uh, any Envoy syntax or configuration, so Pilot will, will take care of that. That's really interesting because it will actually abstract, so if it needs to change anything, we can still use Envoy for that. Mixer is where usually what access control is done and where metrics are collected. So Envoy as a sidecar will collect metrics for observability, for requests or whatever it is, and it will actually pass, pass them to Mixer, which will then forward them somewhere. Uh, we'll see an example in a bit. Citadel is, uh, is basically uh, used uh, for authentication and for, for, for some policy. Uh, if you, for example, Istio provides a mutual, t a mutual TLS, and it will be this component which will actually be responsible for issuing certificates and give them to all of your applications. And last but not least, Galley is basically the validation and ingestion of all the files. It will make sure that everything is correct and that it can uh, be spread to all the systems. It's one interesting thing is that Galley uh, will obtain the information from the underlying uh, system, for example, Kubernetes. So if we want to add another system like Nomad or whatever it is, it will be this component and the other components don't need to be touched. So what capabilities act does actually uh, issue provide us? One of it is traffic control. So since we have a sidecar along, uh, along our applications, we'll have like a proxy. So we can actually start to offload some of the things that our code usually does to that. So some two examples that we'll be, uh, be looking at is how canary deployments can be done with, uh, with Istio and uh, an example of a dark launch. So I, companies like Amazon and Netflix has been doing this for several years. Usually they have their own libraries, their, their own stuff. So this is a nice way to actually start getting this into our, uh, our systems without having that much of a trouble of implementing them. So we'll, let's start with canary deployments. I believe that most of you are familiar with uh, the story of a canary deployment, coal miners that would bring a canary to, to the coal mine. As soon as the canary collapsed, they knew that it, they, uh, they needed to get out. So the idea here is, uh, is similar. So the idea is that you start, you deploy a new application alongside your old one, start routing some traffic, a small portion. As soon as you are confident that everything is, is going okay, you start to route more and more traffic and eventually deprecate the old version and get the new one. So how can we do this with Istio? So Istio has two, compo two, two components. Basically, destination rule. We'll, don't, we'll uh, just, just touch uh, briefly on the code. So a destination rule is actually where you specify what your applications uh, are. So if anyone is familiar with Kubernetes uh, files, it will, this will look very, very familiar. So basically here, on a destination rule, you actually specify what your applications are. So here, here we have an example, an example of a recommendation system, and we're saying that if the recommendation system has a label V1, it will be called label, uh, version V1, and the same for version V2. This is just for discovery. And here, on a virtual server, for service, is there where we actually will do the um, our canary deployment. At this, uh, in this example, we're saying that if some, some request comes for the recommendation service, we'll forward all the traffic there. So how can we do uh, some uh, canary deployment with this? So this is very simple. So as you can see here, we can start by tra uh, routing uh, only 10% of the traffic and maintain 90% of the traffic to the old one. And we start gradually increasing the traffic between the, the versions, and eventually we'll only have V2 and 100%. And 100 so no, co no code changes, very simple to do this. If you're using Kubernetes, this is already possible with, um, with services, but you don't have this uh, degree of granularity. So for example, imagine that you want only 10% of your traffic to be routed to the new version. You can basically have two services, 10 pods, and like nine pods are version one, one pod is version two, and then you start to play with that. This is a very nice and declarative way to actually forward only a specific part of the traffic to that one. 
one of the good things that you can actually do is actually still have the version one running, and you just need to change this file to revert the traffic back to the to the old application. Another thing that you can do with issue is basically is use headers to actually to, for traffic. So the pre, in the previous um, in the previous example, we saw the host space. So we're basically saying, okay, if the app has v1 for traffic or v2, here you can actually, this is just an example for a Safari uh, browser, but you can have like IPs, IPs from your office, from your VPN, whatever, your imagination is, your, is the world, you can go to the sky. So basically you can have like regex here and you can all, uh, speci specify that a, a specific uh, condition will forward traffic to a specific version and, and so, so <coughs> sorry, and so forth. A dark launch is an example of something that you can actually um, do with, um, with Istio. So it will probably mean different things to different people, but the basic idea of a dark launch is that it's not available to the general public. Maybe you want to release something for a specific customer, or you want to actually test within the office um, uh, before actually uh, releasing to the public. And you can do that with the Canary deployment that we've seen previously. One other cool thing that Istio allows you to do with a dark launch is actually replay all the requests. So the, the basic idea is that you have traffic going to your uh, old application, you deploy a new one, it's not generally available, and you allow Istio to just replay all the traffic that is, that is coming in. It's really, really simple to do this. It's, it's, it's so easy that you can get into trouble. Uh, Trust me, I try this. So basically, you just basically have a, um, a virtual service and just say, okay, now every, every request that comes to version two, uh, version one, actually send it, send it to version two. Uh, because it is so simple, it's yeah, actually fire and forget. It's issue doesn't manage any of this traffic. It's just really only only thing that it does is actually forward it. And, and of course, you have to take care of other stuff. So, so if you're using the same database or that kind of stuff, you have to be careful because it's live traffic or you know, the deployment that you uh, deploy it. So let's uh, delve into service resilience. Oh, actually, one more topic I was forgetting. By default, Istio blocks all egress traffic. So imagine that you have an application that has a bug, someone gets in and tries to fetch something and, get, and gets out. But since traffic is all is going to your, through your proxy, it will actually block, Istio will block it and won't allow it. So you have to explicitly say what, um, what are the, where the <clears throat> sorry, where your traffic need, needs to go. So in this example, we're just saying that uh, we have an egress uh, root, uh, rule for a world clock API. We allow traffic on, on port 80, so this will be allowed, anything else won't be. So let's delve in service resilience. So something that we usually do uh, on our systems that we have to deal with. Try, uh, retry, timeout, service fail, service go down, services are slow, so we have to deal with that. What if it was actually interesting to offload that capability to something that only deals with that? So that's where Istio comes, uh, comes, into, um, comes into mind. So it will allow us to actually offload all of those capabilities into your proxy and uh, letting your applications only actually deal with business code. So how can that be done? So one of the things that you can do is like load balancing. So like we said, uh, Envoy is a proxy. It will allow three kinds of uh, load balancing. By default, it will do round robin, like a service in, uh, in Kubernetes. It also has random, it's random, completely random. It doesn't look at anything, just forwards traffic to, to something. And it has a, a, a sir, how do I say, uh, something similar to a weighted uh, load balancing. So what it will do, it will actually choose to uh, two instances of your, of your uh, applications randomly, and then look at those, and the one that has less requests, it will fall to that. So it's basically nice. It will, it's, it's evolving at, as we speak, and something like a weighted load, ba load balancing will be uh, better in the future. Another thing that it can do is basically have timeouts. So as you can see, you can offload your timeouts uh, from your code to, um, to a virtual service with actually one line of code, which is really interesting. It will, this will be converted to something that Envoy uh, actually understands. Another thing is a retry. We all do this, so we are connecting to a recommendation, uh, to a recommendation system, and it will basically, here we will saying it will retry three, try, three times, and between each retry, it will wait for two seconds. So on the application side, it will be agnostic. It only knows that it, it's connecting to something, and it will, after uh, X amount of seconds, will actually fail. So, uh, uh, Istio will actually do all of this uh, management for us. 
and it also has some support for some, for some circuit breaking. So uh, you all guys have fuses at home. If you have a spike in energy, the, the, your, uh, your, your, your fuse will open and the circuit will open. So the idea of a circuit, breaking, of a circuit breaker is, is a, it's the same concept. So the idea is that if a certain condition is met, you won't allow any more traffic or anything to happen on that part of the system. So here is an example of uh, a circuit breaking ba based on requests. So what we're saying here is that if we have, if our applications, in this case V2, is handling one request and is, there is one more pending, it won't send any more traffic to that until this, this condition is resolved. We can go a little bit further. It's, it's the concept, it's called pool ejection. So it, but basically what, what we're saying here is that if we have one error, it will actually remove the application from receiving any traffic for 120 seconds. So th this example, like one error probably is a little bit too low, but um, it's just for the sake of examples. And then you can start combining uh, these this concepts with retries, timeouts, and you can do whatever combination you desire. How do we test this? So actually, it's really interesting to have this, um, to have all of this in uh, in our infrastructure. But we only actually see this in practice when things actually fail, right? When a service is slow, when something is failing. Uh, and a few years uh, back, we started to hear a little bit about chaos engineering. Uh, Netflix uh, amazed a little bit the tech world with saying that we uh, we actually break stuff uh, in production on purpose, and people were like, "What are you guys doing?" Uh, so the basic idea is that we actually break stuff, but we don't break we break stuff to actually find that our systems are actually reliable. So we do need to have a way to actually understand that all of those things that we have in practice and that our system will actually work when something is going really bad. So uh, Istio uh, provides some of those um, uh, some of those capabilities to actually inject failure. Because we have a proxy, we can actually go to the proxy and actually inject failure there. And then with this, we can actually test the conditions that we've seen previously. So let's see two examples. One will be errors. So again, very simply, we can actually have a virtual service for our recommendation. And we're just saying like 50% of the request will have a 503. And this will actually be reflected uh, in the application. And then we can start to test those timeouts and those retries. Another thing that ECU allows is delays, which in most cases are even worse than actually having a, an error. So you don't even know if this, the, whatever services you're, you're, you're connecting is actually working. It just takes a, lo a long time. Did it fail? Did it, it didn't fail? Whatever it is. So it's really nice to actually inject this kind of failure and see how your system behaves and how, how you can deal with this. So again, very simple. You just have a fixed delay. It has other options. It's an example of fixed delay. So 50% of the requests will actually um, will wait for at least seven seconds. So if the, the system that is uh, connecting is even slower, so at least seven sec seconds it will be uh, waiting. Another concept like we've seen in the beginning is observability. So when we have like dozens and dozens of services, we need a way to actually see where requests are going, uh, which services are slow, uh, what's happening in our system. We need that. So a customer will say that, uh, okay, I'm trying to log in, I can't, I'm trying to do a purchase, it does, it's not working, what the hell is going on? And we do need to have a way to not like logging into dozens of services, in services, tailing logs. So um, something that started to uh, emerge a few years back, it's uh, observability systems. Uh, one, of this, one of those is tracing. There's a, a standard already called open tracing. And two co important concepts uh, for observability are a span, which basically is um, it's, a, it's a block of time that has a name, has a starting time and a duration, and traces which are basically uh, um, uh, <clears throat> an aggregate of, the, of those spans. So let's see an example of something that actually works that in production. There's something called Jaeger. There's more. There's one called Zipkin. Jaeger was developed by Uber, I think. Uh, so here is an idea of what issue can give you. So we have a request that comes into customer, that goes into preference, that goes in, into recommendation. Here we can see uh, how long did it take on each of, of those operations. You can have stuff here like database requests. So say I sent a, a query to my database, it took X amount of seconds. So um, here we can easily see what's actually uh, happening in our system. One thing to be, ad to be advised is something like this will actually 
put some load on your systems because now we were actually telling your proxy to now uh, get metrics from all requests. So this might be fine for staging or sandbox or some other kind of environment, but for production, this needs to be tweaked. So by default, uh, East you gets metrics from all requests, but that's highly configurable. So you can actually say to just take metrics from X amount of requests and it should be fine for most production systems. Another thing that we need to collect is metrics, so we can have whatever custom metrics we want. Istio by default will collect a lot of a lot of stuff like requests, errors, uh, all status codes. This is an example of a Prometheus integration, which is by default what uh, Istio uses. So all those kinds of metrics that um, the Envoy proxy collects and sends to Mixer are all, always forward to Prometheus, and then you can put on top of, on top of that whatever. Uh, whatever you want. Grafana, you can forward this to Datadog, whatever your, the world is your imagination. And one very interesting uh, thing that uh, issue has from day one is the concept of a service graph. So I believe that some of you might uh, change companies, you get to a junior team, you see something, so how are these services connected, who speaks to what, what requests send, be sent to what, uh, what, what services, but even in, in production, so uh, you are actually seeing that uh, the customer talks to preference, but maybe there was some bug and this connection went down. How do we actually do this? So from day one, uh, Issue has this support. And Kial is something that is being, is being uh, developed by Red Hat. It's very interesting. It will ask for a lot. This is still a little bit complex to actually deploy, but it's, but it's doable. Um, and the basic idea, it will ask for permissions to actually access Prometheus and all kinds of stuff in Sistio. And it will do this inference um, uh, for you without having actually to do anything. Last but not least, security. So we are now talking about dozens of services, different teams deploying code. Uh, even simple, simple applications can have like security holes. You can have uh, a service that is, that is exposed and actually expose your whole infrastructure and you just, can just get in and get information from your clients. That's not desirable. So um, is you actually provide some of that, those capabilities for you. So let, let's see some of those. So mutual TLS can be actually developed, um, deployed b via configuration. So the, the basic idea would be mutual TLS is when, when two services connect to each other that actually uh, are sure that are talking to each other. So it, this will be do, done by, uh, by H2 itself. It will provide uh, certificates for each of them and uh, the proxies will negotiate and see that uh, service A is actually who he says it is and service B is actually who he says it is. So how do we do this? Uh, this is done by default, but then we have a problem. If you're running on Kubernetes, you actually now need to connect to the outside. Probably something that we all do is actually get traffic for until our perimeter of our, of our systems is encrypted, and then inside it isn't. So now that we have TLS, um, for those of you who are familiar with um, with Kubernetes, they are probably one of the ways that you get traffic into your system is like using ingress. Issue has its own ingress system, and it's basically a configuration like any other for, for, uh, for Kubernetes, where you actually provide a, an ingress gateway and then you route traffic. Everything that comes with a forward slash will go to customer. It's as simple as this. Another concept is access and control. Like we, I was, I was uh, speaking before, uh, you can have one application that for some reason has, uh, is exposed and now you can get, uh, basically uh, get into your whole system and start playing around and fetching information. With this, you can actually start to block those kinds of, uh, those kinds of uh, the, those, the, that kind of stuff. So basically what we're saying here is that customer only talks to, to preference and preference only talks to recommendation. And this is how it is enforced. So basically we're saying that if we have a, a label, uh, an app with a label customer and a label recommendation, that is not allowed. So this is a nice way to actually enforce, and if you are under some kind of uh, compliance, like uh, PCI compliance, this is a way to actually show auditors uh, that you are actually enforcing those kinds of policies and actually traffic is not allowed to a certain path uh, within your, your system. And of course, uh, Airbag, which is role-based access control, uh, Kubernetes already does that to, uh, so for you. This is important since you might have a an, an, uh, hybrid mesh uh, where you have stuff inside and outside uh, your service mesh. And it, it's basically, we're just saying you know, which users can actually do, in this example, get requests to a certain application. 
uh, this is, uh, these are, although this is using the Istio API, these are, these are concepts that are already, um, already present in Kubernetes, so a service role, basically it's, it's a role like any, uh, like uh, on any system, and a service role balling is ba basically attaching a role to something. And there's much more on this. So this is like a very brief introduction of the, those kinds of cap capabilities. So you can have like advanced ingress rules, stuff that get, starts getting uh, uh, very complex. You can have hybrid deployments. You have a service mesh and you can attach to stuff to it and it gets starts to get really uh, challenging. You can have, uh, have for a policy informants. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of, of stuff can be there on top of this. And that's it for my part. I hope this gives you uh, a nice idea of what a service mesh is, what capabilities uh, it gives you. Um, I, for, from my experience, I, uh, one of the things that, I, that we started doing was by using the observability part. And that's uh, once we got stuff in, we could actually uh, convince the business to act. Okay, so now maybe it's interesting. We can start to offload some stuff out of your our application code, or we can leave it there, but turn it off and then just delete the code. But that's exactly what we want. Like we we want the least code possible uh, to maintain. So thank you all. If you guys have any questions, just shoot them.